Hello and welcome to the first edition of Green TV for this new year, 2022. And in thinking about what I'd like to start out this um, bright new year, bright in, in many ways, uh, we're gonna focus on the positive certainly today. I thought what's more up and interesting and promising than EVs? Uh, and of course our founder, John Lake is a big longtime EV enthusiast and retrofits internal combustion cars and other vehicles, turns them into electric. Uh, but I thought it'd be fun to get some experts together and John is shy or he would be here um, to talk about your, your outlook, the predictions that you have. They don't have to be accurate. We won't hold you to them, but there's been such a surge in interest, none too soon, finally, uh, that there have to be some really exciting forecasts based in reality, of course, and, and trends and numbers. And so I'm so pleased to get this little panel of big time experts on uh, electric vehicles, uh, beginning with Dr. Veronica Wright Obersteiner if I said that right. Uh, congratulations on your new book. I see that one of your um, taglines is one, it's 100% 100 possible if you don't try. I love that. I've been trying to finish my book for more years than I want to count. So congratulations to you. It's, it's not easy. And the book is all about um, driving to electric or electric future. And uh, congratulations, hot off the press. We're going to hear all about that, um, the motivation behind writing it, and a little bit more about your background in a second. But I also want to introduce uh, Eric Smith, uh, who is an EV enthusiast and an energy efficiency expert, and Richard Souter, who is a consultant and passionate about EVs and a fleet operations manager, if I got all that correctly. Um, you can fill in some blanks here. In fact, let's start because uh, just in the intro, I did hear some pretty interesting background. So give us sort of the one minute synopsis of what brought you here today. 29 years in the Navy, uh, got to see a lot of things, do a lot of things. Uh, but the biggest thing was especially coming out of a combat environment where we use solar panels overseas to shorten the number of fuel transfers was really appreciative of how it saved lives, both directly and saved the money as well. And so as the services started to convert over to solar PV and electric vehicles, it really became mainstream at the consumer level why this is important for the rest of the world. And so I really became headstrong in the EV space and 2016, when I bought my first electric motorcycle, and I've since owned a Nissan Leaf and a Volkswagen 94, and I really embrace the marketplace and network as much as possible. Headstrong is good in this movement. We need more headstrong and loudmouth leaders. <laughs> loudmouth is in a good way. So, um, Veronica. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, everybody. So I'm originally from Austria, came to the US a year ago to start my own company. It's called Electrified Veronica, short EV. And it's a social enterprise. Um, so I am a physicist and I'm consulting in the industry for batteries, for electric vehicles and all of that. But also I have this passion to share my knowledge and share my know-how by, for example, writing a book about our drive to electric, because I think this is so important, especially in this topic and in today's day and age, we get so much hype for many things and so much headlines everywhere. And sometimes it's really hard to trust to generate trust and figure out what it's or distinguish between facts and fiction. And so I want to try help with that. Congratulations and welcome. Uh, Austria's loss is our gain. <laughs> Accomplished a lot in a very short time and I'm sure we'll continue to. Richard? Yes, uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I've been doing the, uh, I started with EV Consulting about a year and a half ago when uh, the some of the some of the newer startups were asking questions about how to service electric vehicles, and so I kind of started on the infrastructure side. But I've been working with vehicles my whole life. I grew up on a farm, uh, 20 years in the army, working with vehicles. I was a fleet manager there uh, and a technician. Uh, so I've been all over the world: Korea, uh, Germany, 12 years in Germany, and uh, in the United States. And uh, my current business, I'm an operations guy, a fleet management company we run, and it's a, um, everybody wants to know answers. I'm, I'm, I look at it, I'm looked at the solutions guy, and so I wanted to become educated, so I became EP certified through education and uh, several courses, and uh, after being approached by startup EV companies, uh, there is a need for infrastructure which goes along with battery charging and with new models coming out with legacy manufacturers as well as the new startups. And EV is just is huge in 21 and it just begins, it continues to grow. And I really love to see a 2022 where we're gonna have a lot more EVs and a lot more questions from uh, 
from uh, consumers about what the answers are. And I'm here to, to help because I want to be you know, educated and be able to help people. I want to begin rather than jump forward, looking back just a little bit. I've been covering the Green Beat a long time, about two okay. decades plus. Uh, and I remember when Chris Payne's movie, Who Killed the Electric Car, came out. And then, of course, uh, the follow up on that. And at the time that film came out, um, General Motors, I don't know if any of you were paying attention then, was rounding up its first, the first electric vehicle uh, that it had leased out to very enthusiastic environmentalists. Uh, they said there wasn't enough demand. They were um, shipping them, trucking them off to uh, <laughs> Mesa, Arizona and crushing them in the dark of night. And they uh, supposedly set two aside to put in the electric car museum. Uh, that was back in what, about 2005 or so. It was right when one of the um, big hurricanes, not Katrina, but I think it was Rita, hit Galveston, Texas, and all these giant SUVs got stranded as they were heading inland trying to escape the storm, uh, ran out of gas. And of course, the oil rigs were loosened from their moors because of the hurricane. And I just said, what's wrong with this picture? And of course, the answer to who killed the electric car was you know, so many different entities. Um, certainly the car companies were found to be lying about the demand. Uh, the woman who was in charge of the uh, wait list, uh, Chelsea Sexton famously said, no, there were actually 5,000 people on her wait list when General Motors tried to say there was no demand. So that was a big part of the problem. But of course it was an infrastructure issue. It was also the public not being ready or prepared properly to be ready. Uh, but it is, isn't it interesting that it did have to get killed before it was revived? <laughs> And of course, it wasn't the first electric car that was back, you know, with the Fords. But where we, where we are now in 2022 is truly on the precipice of just this uh, tidal wave of interest. And yet, um, as long as I've been tracking this, it's been around two percent of all vehicles are electric, and that's all, and that's pathetic, and that's really crazy. Obviously, we haven't had the charging infrastructure to take, you know, huge demand, but it's getting there. It's going to have to get there quickly. But is it still around two percent? Um, whoever would like to start with that and then uh, talk about what you foresee for the year to come. Go ahead. I would like to go first because I can completely identify with your story because it's also part of my book because um, you know, I started in the battery industry a couple of years ago, and so I'm kind of new to it, but I started talking to somebody that is in a battery industry for the last 30 years. And he was describing to me that this is the third wave He's from North America, the third wave of electrification and batteries that he is experiencing. And of course, he was talking about GM and all this, what happened in the past, which, why did it stop? Partly because of governmental political reasons, but also society was not really ready. But he, for example, said this one will take off. He thinks we are ready, not only in terms of battery technology that is way better today, you know, with longer range and charging times and all of that is in place, but also on the political side, the commitment is there. Society is ready and wants to go electric. Still, there are very lots of uncertainties of people. They're like, are we there yet? Can we start? Can, can I buy an electric car now? Do I find chargers and stuff like this? Um, yeah, the, the couple percentages, it's still true. I think worldwide, depending, of course, on where you look at Sweden, it's different. It's, it's more than 10%. But um, so it happens, and especially in the last year, the numbers really, really were raising. And, and why do you think, uh, Richard or Eric, we're seeing this surge right now? It really does feel like third time will be a charm. This, this is it. There's no going back. Uh, was it all the extreme weather? Um, were the uh, car companies just shamed into it? Um, you know, what, what got people over range anxiety, or, or why do we see that starting to shift? I think it has to do with uh, really exposure. Uh, I'm glad you brought up Chelsea Sexton. I've listened to a number of her podcasts and interviews, and she's always said the same thing about that GM1 or the, yeah, the EV1, is that once you get in the car, and we've all experienced the whole butts and seats analogy, once people drive it, they appreciate it. And then they realize, oh, there's a lot of other benefits to it. And the beauty is that you're now starting to see electric vehicles every day you know it's kind of like the, the old joke when you buy a particular model of a vehicle you start to realize just how many of them are being driven around you like for myself i drive a volkswagen id4 in atlanta georgia and we've had it since may i think i've seen three maybe four other id4s actually being driven on the road but you're starting to see teslas you're starting to see a lot of porsche Taycans. so you're the exposure point where especially then a vehicle gets parked in a neighborhood usually a little more 
of the means capable where people have garages, they have the ability to put in the charging infrastructure from the convenience standpoint, then the neighbors start to ask, hey, I see you got a new car, what is it? And so that exposure just speaks volumes for the market because then it starts to realize, hey, this is a very real thing. You know, so-and-so has a job similar to me or so-and-so doesn't drive as far or maybe they do drive across town and they still have an electric vehicle. I should look into that. That might be a thing for me. Social social influence is really a key factor. And the social science has shown that for years. And, and I've experienced it. My, I'm from the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, lived in Marin for most of the last couple of decades. And there were lots of Priuses, of course, around. Uh, let's see, there were so many Priuses. The, um, what was it? Uh, the, there, was, there was the smug level. And SMUG, smug level was high, something like that. Um, and then we started seeing a lot of Teslas, but you'd expect that in a more affluent eco, somewhat eco forward um, community, although there's a lot of, you know, major footprints with people with money, bigger houses, bigger cars in general, bigger footprints. But we moved to the outskirts of Austin, Texas in 2018, where it's pretty conservative because it's out in hill country. And when we started seeing Teslas, you know, being driven by our neighbors, we got very excited. We were the first out of 200 homes in our development to put solar panels on, and we had to fight for them in large part because we have a lot of people in our development with, from the oil industry. But now we're starting to see more. I wanted to make sure those panels were on the front of the house, not the back, so we could say with pride, this is something that in a place where the sun beats down and it's triple digits, many summer days should have solar panels. So yeah, that can't underestimate that importance. Um, did your neighbors really fight you on the aesthetics or yes. because they saw you undermine the their the, livelihood? Well, the, the, that may have been the, the subtext, but what they said was they just didn't like the look of them. And we showed them that they, A, they would barely see them, B, their Tesla panels are very attractive, of course, and they would barely be in their line of sight. They said, we, and when it came right down to it, because we had to go to the homeowners association, they said, we just don't like solar panels. And so they probably you know, have a fossil fuel bias. And uh, the good news is that there is a law that says that unless you're interfering with a homeowner's ability to enjoy their property, you can't block it because of solar panels. So we won, but uh, you should have seen the looks on their faces when these gray haired people said, well, electricity is so cheap in Texas. Why would you want solar panels? My husband looked at them and said, for my granddaughter, and I said, and all of your grandchildren, like, oh, <laughs> you know, like there's another factor here. That was three years ago. Uh, so Richard, uh, your thoughts on and just what's behind the, the none too soon surge in popularity. And I mean, I can't even keep up with all the different companies and models that are coming up with them. And I'd like to hear from each of you, some of your favorites. Yeah, I think the, uh, my opinion is uh, people are just more aware in the last several years, been more aware of the climate change and they know what's going on. And I think the, the people that think about it and, and use a little of thought process say something, something's not right. And I credit Tesla be, as being a pioneer. You know, they've been building cars for 10, 11 years. Uh, they sold almost a million cars this year. When you get that kind of exposure and people see that, it, that's kind of a domino effect. And of course, it's, all, it's, it's really about investments too. So when people say, oh, we sold a million cars, what, what's going on? Well, maybe, maybe we need to sell electric cars. So, you know, the, the legacy manufacturers such as Ford really jumped on the bandwagon. They're far ahead of, you know, and uh, I, I credit also to the younger generation. My son is a, he's a graduate, he's an engineer. He worked for Ford for several years and now he's working for another vendor for Ford that does electric. So him and I changed notes a lot. So I'm kind of uh, keyed in on the younger generation and the millennials and, uh, you know, their, their concern. And this is a really push from their side, but it's also, a, a, a situation where there's investments involved. You know, the government's involved now with with price subsidies, with possible some um, you know some assistance with the EV charging system, and there's a lot of money on the table. So, I think it kind of goes hand in hand. You got you got a Tesla giant in the in the in the, in the room, and then you have uh, a million cars being sold in one year, which it's almost double from last year. And everybody wants to be involved. They say, well, how do you do this? Well. Uh, there's there's some that have jumped on it like Ford is a, is huge. I mean they did 200,000 uh, pre-orders of Ford F-150 Lightning within within a couple of months, and now they're trying to figure out how they're going to produce those. And they've already looked at doubling in production within one year. They went from uh, up to they're probably going to produce 160,000 trucks next year, which is amazing for a, a one single model. 
By the way, the head of GM at the time that they were trying to kill their electric car and did uh, successfully has been quoted as saying after he left the company that that was his biggest regret. That was his biggest mistake. As, as of course it should be, because when GM came out with this big push about their commitment to building electric cars, you know, it's like, well, they could have been way ahead, you know, but not only a few of us remember that, but I, I talk about it a lot. Uh, Veronica. Yeah, so I agree with everything that has been said. And I think especially in the North American market, what was really, really important to drive the adoption of electric vehicles is entering the truck market. Because you know, worldwide in China and Europe, people don't drive trucks so much. They are more interested in maybe smaller and efficient cars. But China here is smarter. Really, You've always been eco forward compared to. It's America. really a thing here to have a truck, right? And I <laughs> love trucks also. It's it's just it's just cool. So it's just so wonderful to see GM, Ford, Tesla. R Rivian, so all the like big companies and also new startups providing now these options, these big monstrous cars that everybody muscle wants cars. to muscle have. Cars. They're very popular in my neighborhood, that F-150, they're all over the Exactly, place. exactly. So I think this really helped driving the adoption. People can now see, okay, this car that they're familiar with, the Ford F-150, everybody knows that. Now there is an electric version for that, wonderful. And a long wait list for it. Yes. yes, I don't get so my husband also ordered one or wanted to order one, but we don't even <laughs> we didn't make it make it. My husband got, don't on, need one, just my husband one. got on the wait list. I don't know why he has a Tesla. He said he just wanted to. He's so excited. <laughs> Maybe it'll be good resale value. <laughs> like who would have thought, you know? <laughs> so if we can turn that a minute and let's talk to Richard since he's the fleet manager in the group. Hmm. I've seen two commentaries about, you know, con contrasting opinions about the Ford F-150 and the recently announced Chevy e Silverado in that the Ford is a typical frame on chassis design and most customers wanted to keep it a very familiar layout. Now, hmm. granted, you go with that route, you have common parts and replacement equipment. Ford can bring it to market very quickly and then they can do the due diligence to research a new design, put the batteries into the frame become structural member and then redesign the pickup three, four years down the road. Chevy went the alternate route. Chevy went with a brand new design from the ground up, putting the batteries into the frame, giving a different layout on the interior of the cab. However, they're also gonna be two years delayed to market compared to Ford. Where are the thoughts from the fleet perspective? Is it what's available first? Or do you find that some customers still have a preference or brand loyalty? And, and speaking of fleets, I mean, the good news is out of New York, right? That's got to make a big difference. The recent um, millions of dollars, 400 million or something allocated yep. to electrify fleets and fleets that where it's always made sense, especially on college campuses or mail trucks or FedEx, Amazon trucks, you know, that really has to jump forward. Well, I can speak to that. Uh, the fleet side, uh, the commercial markets, you know, I deal with owners, CEOs that they don't like change. Uh, they like the fact that they can have an option, but with, they're really scared of the infrastructure not being there and towing capabilities and the range of a truck and working a truck hard. And, and a lot of like the public or the municipal, they're going more towards it because they have a little bit more control because it's a government and they have a budget. And they say that we can switch out 10 or 20% of our, our fleet because we know the mileage, we know where they go every day. There's a set standard. But a lot of the, lot of the commercial uh, fleets are really, the biggest thing they're getting into is last mile delivery, which is the, the Elms vehicle and the Arval and the, and the Bright Drop. That's where all the commercial stuff is right now. It's not about the interview, small companies, or even larger companies. The larger company is going to take 10% and say, let's try it. And if the cost is less, then it's going to be feasible for them to do it. But the uh, the big push right now, if you've seen the electric buses, I mean, it, there's uh, an E-Line. That's what is huge right now. And last mile delivery is, is huge because there's so many people in the market, but not so much smaller commercial companies. And speaking of buses, school buses, that is the best most logical application, seeing little kids at the level of, you know, the exhaust coming out of the back of the bus, just especially in cities like New York. I mean, it's just sickening, right? And and that's got to happen quickly. Um, well, I think you're going to see a, a big um, difference between like where you live in Texas versus inner city like New York mm -hmm. in terms both of battery capacity, because people think, well, it's a big vehicle, it needs a big battery. 
but you don't because then there's companies like I think it's Momentum Dynamics that is doing wireless charging and they did a pilot program with Jaguars uh, in a taxi service whereby short increments of idle time whereby you are parked in a wireless charger can quickly recharge your battery and therefore you need a smaller battery in a still capable format. And so it's interesting when you take that thought process to a commercial application like electric buses, whereby it makes sense. You can, you can electrify more bus powertrains quickly with smaller batteries, as long as you have that wireless infrastructure charging set up. But to the point of why a bus runs on a certain route is it's the same route. It's the same mileage. It's almost always the same time scale. So, or the timeline. So you can set up these regular repetitive charging efforts and wireless makes sense. But then you go to much like other fleet assignments who are a little more dynamic, a little less stringent on their timeline. And it's almost a capital expenditure. It's not worth going toward. When Tesla first came out, there was, you know, there's a lot of Tesla haters and there was a lot of criticism that, oh, well, you know, batteries aren't so eco-friendly and they're going to run out. What are they going to do with those? Um, And yet I haven't heard of that happening so much. Uh, Let me know whoever if you would like to comment on that, there was just a silly story about some guy blowing up his Tesla because he was told he'd have to spend, I don't know, $9,000, $11,000 to get a new battery. That was from 2013. Uh, and he figured it'd be smarter to blow it up, but he mostly wanted to do it for the YouTube views or something silly. But what what is the state of batteries that are going into the most popular brands of electric vehicles, like, like Tesla, for instance? You know, a a typical warranty and a typical lifetime of a battery in a Tesla is almost around 10 years. So the thing is, it really depends on how you use a battery in an electric vehicle, like how long it would last. Also with your smartphone, it's the same. If you charge it at low temperatures a lot, it will last a little bit less than if you treat it in a nice way. So batteries actually want to be treated like humans. They really enjoy temperatures like room temperature because you know they're running electrochemical processes that like us humans, we like room temperature. We don't like going super fast. We don't like, (laughs) so it can be compared to that. So if you treat a battery, right? Then I guess around five, 10 years, something like this is a good range for a battery in an electric vehicle. The nice thing or interesting thing that people don't know about very often is that once we say the battery is dead in an electric vehicle, it still has 80% of the capacity. It's just not good enough and high performant enough for the car, but you can still use it. So what I just love seeing, and there will be so much more going on next year or this year and the years later, is reusing these used batteries from electric vehicles and giving them a second life. So installing, taking these and installing them in stationary energy storage systems, complementing a solar system or whatever other needs and really squeezing out and really maximizing the lifetime of the batteries. This gives them another 10 years. Overall, we're around 20 years and more. So I would think this is a pretty good lifetime. And are they any more toxic than batteries in internal combustion cars? I would imagine they're larger, more powerful, so perhaps they are. And are they built to last longer um, because of this concern? So the batteries for for all electric cars use a completely different chemistry than the starter batteries in cars. Um, They are more lightweight and they are more energy dense. So this is the reason we're using them. Um, There is a big discussion about the materials, the raw materials used in these batteries, you know, lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese, all these. And we have to be just careful. How do we handle this and you know about the supply chains we heard a lot of problems in the last year and we have to think about how much we use from which chemistry and also to retrieve these materials back through recycling and while there is lots of rumors and really bad news about that the industry really wants to take care of that and really does this So it really, they work on this kind of circular economy where it's really then a circle. And at some point you don't have to mine new raw materials anymore and really can use recycling as a local mining opportunity. This works. Is there a real risk though in the next decade or so that some of these materials, these minerals could run out and then what? 
that's always the, the the huge headline we're running out of lithium we're running out of whatever they just recently found a cool uh, like they they start mining lithium now in austria in my home country and they found found so much lithium they can supply whole europe with it so sometimes i think we really have to be careful not following all these headlines what does it even mean are we running out of lithium then we need to understand how much how many vehicles do we actually need and, and perhaps there will be number. substitutes uh, developed. <laughs> so I think it's a good chance for us now going electric to really think sustainable and really build the supply chain and this economy sustainable. Mm. It's an opportunity. And, and but to that point, uh, Veronica, what's nice about the Aus Austrian discovery is that it's actually in a brine solution from three various wells where they're looking at it as a byproduct of mining, if you will, that brine solution. And oh, by the way, you can get lithium out of it. So the neat, at least the article that I read about it was the company was filing some patents to go after utilizing the primary brine solution for whatever industry it was used for. And then, oh, by the way, we're gonna skirt off some lithium in the process. And they envision that it'll solve 25% of the European demand signal for lithium for the next two to three years. And that's just amazing. When you look at what's already available and what already exists to the point that it's just a matter of looking at the same problem set with a different slant and it can still be good for the environment without tremendously breaking up uh, the environmental constraint and impact of the process. And we need to talk about charging infrastructure. Of course, that is a big piece of this. Um, Ryan Baggett, who uh, runs a group called EV Angelist, he's part of our Green TV team. Uh, he's been looking at this closely, working on that and trying to create corridors so you don't have any gaps if you're trying to dr uh, drive across the country. By the way, we drove from San Francisco. <laughs> I missed my, I left my heart there, Richard. I'm looking at your Golden Gate Bridge. I also <laughs> left my heart in the Bahamas two days ago. I was lucky enough to be in NASA. That's why I have that picture still there. Um, don't feel bad for me. It's all right. I'm in New York. It could be worse. Could be worse. Even though we got four inches of snow today, talk about climate change. Um, so the the whole issue of batteries, we almost made it completely to Austin. You know, with just Tesla supercharger stops, we were ten miles short of one coming into, I believe it was Albuquerque, and um, I knew about PlugShare. So on my my husband was very impressed because uh, it was his Tesla we were driving, but I found out that it, just three miles ahead was an RV park. As a good navigator should. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and I'm the, I, hey, I, I test drove a Tesla before Elon Musk even ran it. Someone named Martin, somebody drove up to our studio mm -hmm. on Green Street in San Francisco a dozen years ago, and I got to not drive it, but be a passenger. And he gets the Tesla years ahead of me, but I, I digress. So we were able to plug in in an RV park and they wanted, I guess it was a $20 charge, but the woman was so nice, she didn't even want to take the money. So I knew then that, gosh, if we can get halfway across the country with no problem, um, it, it can't be far behind. But that implies that you thought ahead and had the appropriate charger and you know the dongles and the adapters and whatever in the vehicle. Unless you're saying that when you pull in the RV site, that someone there was kind enough yeah. to loan those to you. Yeah, we had we had what we had and it worked. <laughs> and I don't know, we mm -hmm. had anything extra. Maybe does it come with a regular charger? I can't remember. Uh, but Beside, that's besides the point, the charging system, how far away are we from really having something that can reduce or eliminate range anxiety for the average driver, not the, you know, green activist or, you know, EV enthusiast, God bless us, but just normal folks, Americans. <laughs> I'd love Richard to take this one first, please. Okay. Um, I definitely follow, uh, you know, EV charging every day. I post on, uh, uh, on LinkedIn every day, and I, EV charging is a big thing. You know, there's a lot of money going to EV charging right now, and there's a lot of big companies, uh, you know, EVgo, ChargePoint, uh, Blink. I mean, I mean, they're publicly traded. Uh, they have money. They're looking for the best options to build those in the most efficient ways. And of course, there's going to be gov government subsidies. There's going to be uh, local and, and uh, state subsidies. You know, I see articles every day. A city that's you know got a grant or uh, or got a contract with a with a charging company that's putting in trying to help the city. So at the city level, there's a lot of activity right now. Uh, you know, there's going to always going to be oh, big open spaces in the Midwest uh, where there's going to be a charger issues. But you know, there's a lower population, there's less vehicles, but and they're going to be you know lower in the priority 
on the priority, but there's been huge, uh, you know, uh, progress in the EV charging this year and next year, if, especially if we get additional money from the government and we ever get to the point where uh, those those monies are, are given out and then they can have uh, more opportunity to, to build chargers. But, you know, I see them all the time and, uh, you know, now they're putting it, you know, gas stations or Tesla's always had the superchargers at the at gas stations. Um, but you see them at the markets at, where people shop, they're getting big right now. Uh, so people can shop and charge their cars. But, you know, that's that's just part of the EV charges. You know, the, the, the great answer is if everybody had a house with a charger. But, you know, there's a lot of people that only have condos and they only have, uh, you know, uh, townhouses where they're not available. Uh, so they have to go in other places. But the biggest issue I see is that, um, you know, having the, uh, the resources and, you know, with the investments of people making the stock market right now, especially the biggest players, uh, they're going to they're gonna make it happen. They're going to, this system will grow. There's no doubt. And as far as addressing, the only other rumor I can think of uh, where people have, you know, in the past, not so much recently, but early days, you know, expressed concern or skepticism about driving an electric car was, well, if you're in an accident, it's going to be more likely to explode. Is that completely urban myth? What, what, has, the, what has the experience proven? I think it is because... Unfortunately, they receive most of the highlight in the news cycle, depending on which uh, data point you read. Every car has the opportunity to explode, whether it's an ICE or an EV. It's just ICE explosions and ICE fire vehicles almost don't hit the news cycle on such a frequency as EV. It's the new hot thing. Give it three, four years. I doubt we're going to be reading about, oh, another Tesla caught fire you know, in this accident. And by um, the way, I stand back, for internal combustion engine in case anybody watching is. Yes. Um, but back to your infrastructure question. And I'm going to tee this up for Veronica because, you know, of the three of us, she's done most of the academic rigor, if you will, for her book prep. But I am a big proponent of arguing with people on LinkedIn and other media sites is that the speed of charging is all about convenience. If you have long dwell time, you know, much like Veronica said, that's the best time to charge a vehicle. You know, low temperatures, low speed, it lets the battery uh, do an internal cell balancing at a much stronger level for longevity of the battery life. But most people don't want to do that. Most people think of it like a ICE vehicle. They want to be able to, you know, dip the pump in, fill it up, and then be on their way. 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes tops. But that's all going to be an inverse of convenience. So you're going to pay more for fast charging. You're going to pay more for a shorter time cycle or like what Richard alluded to at the beginning, you know, he just delivered the lucid air. That's a very high capacity battery with a very long range. But most Americans are not going to be driving 400 miles on a stint on one day, one day charge. Especially when more Americans than ever are working from home and will be. Yeah, I, I think the whole charging topic and lots of other topic with with electric vehicles really needs a change in mindset. People need to be open to think differently. They can't just do the one to one comparison to what they're used to. I was yesterday also in an interview with with a YouTuber. We were talking about that. And, you know, very often people want to see charging times of three to five minutes. And I'm like, think about it. Do we really need this? Like. Just we have big screens in every Tesla and every electric vehicle now and everybody watches Netflix every day. Can we use this time 20 minutes, 25 minutes? It's not a lot of time. Um, can we use this time and watch a Netflix show while we're charging? Don't Just an example. About climate Just change. Just an example. Or this interview. <laughs> <laughs> and but another thing I want to mention is I would like to see some changes in lots of areas, but also for charging in legislation. Surprise. Um, You're not alone. Okay. <laughs> Build, <laughs> back like, better. Build back better. Uh, Where's that? Yeah. yeah, I would like to see, for example, business owners being allowed to install charging stations and charge their customers in Wisconsin. That's not allowed. It's illegal right now in Wisconsin. Really? Wow. Yes. Yeah. Another thing that is illegal, which I was totally not aware of, is you can lease a solar system in Wisconsin. You can't? You no. cannot lease a solar system? No. Why? Why is that? Because um, it's a by law forbidden and lots of people, especially 
you know, the energy generation in Wisconsin is mostly coal burning, they sign against that. But I was involved with, you know, I was going to the Capitol in Madison and with an organization, Reno, Wisconsin, and they really, they want to rewrite these legislations to make it possible to change these things. And so I think this is very, very important. Betsy, uh, it's, they probably treat it fundamentally like a power utility commission generator, and you're an unregulated asset and they will not allow you to connect to the grid. That's usually yeah. the mindset that the legislation takes. Well, one of the, the elephant, the green elephant in the room, of course, is as long as we have a mostly dirty power grid, electric cars aren't going to save us, right? So how important is Build Back Better and other legislation market forces to clean things up? Because it's true, we, if we have solar panels, Tesla solar panels, Tesla battery um, storage in our um, garage and two Teslas. I've got the Tesla three. I, I will never want another car. There's nothing missing from that drive. And, you know, it's reasonably affordable, 35,000, whatever. Um, so that's one question is how do we, um, now that we're going in the right direction in terms of mass adoption of electric vehicles, you know, make sure we <laughs> make sure that they're being charged with cleaner energy and not more of the dirty. And then just the whole you know, acceptance of the fact that the future is here, the future is green or not at all, you know, like wake up America, smell the carbon, we need to get off our gases. So I guess that's leading into my um, question about predictions. I don't want to keep you too long because I could talk all day about these things. Uh, and we have a lot of viewers who are really interested. So we would love to have you back, but just to look ahead at uh, this year, just begun a week underway, exactly. Um, what would you like to see? What do you foresee? And if any of you have any thoughts on Build Back Better, you know, it's sort of just um, hanging in total limbo right now, which is maddening as heck, right? Especially because one man, it seems, is holding up progress and somehow is a Democrat. Don't get me started. <laughs> Who would like well, to go first? You alluded to the Tesla architecture that gives the micro grid approach that you can see a very clean energy production and consumption cycle. I think the flip side of that is what a lot of people find very difficult to believe is that every day the grid is getting greener. So there's that belief that you've got to buy in that really what is good for the gander is good for the goose. And that if you assume that that is factually correct and it's in the best interest of the power companies to go towards sustainable, resilient energy sourcing, then yes, the grid will always be getting greener. And if you buy into that, that's buying that future capacity at current day prices. And that, that is a, you know, I believe button that a lot of consumers need to push. Uh, I think the other part of it is we allude to at the beginning is that the selection opportunities for vehicles becoming so much better uh, during the consumer electronics show that's going on this week. We just saw VinFast come out and publicly say they're building a U.S. headquarters. We're looking to build a factory in Germany. That's and a, a, is that a Vietnamese, the Vietnamese company? It's the yes. first Vietnamese automaker in history, uh, supported by Vin Group, which is a larger consumer electronics uh, group in Vietnam. But it's a well-funded um, company. They've been in the automotive business for about five years. They've just started producing electric vehicles in the last one year. Uh, they were expected to bring two models to the U.S. market this week. They actually announced five total. Uh, I haven't seen the other three yet, but it's in some of the pictures. And so it's going after like the, the RAV4, the CRV, the, you know, the small SUV market, which seems to be the trend these days. I think the beauty of what's going to happen in 2022 and more so in 2023 is you're going to start seeing, yeah, the supply chain dynamics where we're going to get caught up and we're going to start having a little more reasonable price uh, efforts for consumers, but you're going to see turnover of vehicles. And so the big thing that's a consternation factor for a lot of people is the used inventory is just almost non-existent right now. Uh, right before we came on this, I saw someone posted about a Chevy Volt, five-year-old vehicle, 50,000 miles, actually a crude value to the tune of about $530 per month of ownership. And you look at that and you're like, how can that be that a used car is so much more expensive than a new car? Okay, we could get into OEM pricing and dealer dynamics, but we're not going to. The point is, is that until you get through that first one year of ownership or say three years of ownership, like Richard experiences in the fleet world, is that used inventory just isn't available. 
I mean, there's used Teslas on the market, there's used Nissan Leafs on the market, but it's also because they've been around for 10 plus years. So I think that's going to be the biggest thing to look for from a trend is because more mar- uh, more models are becoming available, we're going to see that turnover of ownership. Some people are going to like them, some people are not going to like them, and they're going to move on to something else. But now you have a quote unquote used vehicle available to the next consumer. Mm-hmm. Richard? I look at, uh, I met a good friend this year uh, from Norway, and I had a good friend that was stationed in Norway for three years. And so I got some firsthand, you know, uh, input from him and, and his wife. And Christina Boo from, from Norway is amazing. Uh, I was talking to her today on LinkedIn, and she had just released a Time article. And basically, they 65% of uh, sales in Norway are electric cars right now. All the sales of cars, 65%. And they see that probably hitting 80 to 85% next year. And of course, they're unique in a unique position. They have you know wind, solar, and, and hydropower. 99% of their energy is efficient. They, you know, sustainable. They don't have to use anything else, but uh, we're not in that situation. We're still, you know, doing coal burning. And, uh, but I really think that um, the EV market right now, I think we did 6.6 million EVs worldwide last year or in 2021. And, and people are really predicting a 10 million uh, EV sales in 2022. I think it's, it's, it's going to get close to that. Um, there's a lot more, like Eric said, there's a lot more uh, cars are in the market that are, that are less expensive. People are looking for a $30,000 car. Right now, the, I'm in a car business, so uh, average new car price is $49,600 this year. Average price of a used car is twenty nine six dollars uh, because the used market, there's, there's so little supply and very big demand. Uh, but I think we're going to, as we see these $30,000, like the, the, uh, the Canoe and the uh, GM um, Equinox, Chevy Equinox, and uh, other cars that are going to hit the $30,000 range. You're going to see more people getting them uh, and using this more efficiently. But I really think that when you, when you talk about buy, uh, build back better, the money really, I mean, you got to have to use some thought process. Everybody's got to use some common sense. You know, we have to use, you know, solar, water, and, uh, you know, resource we have. Solar, solar using for EV charges is the thing to do if we can. Uh, so I think that, you know, the money should be spent on something wise, like, uh, you know, you know, energy that can be used like solar. It's just the way it should be, uh, so, not to worry about the, on the grid. So even a Tesla 3, if you get the basic model, it was around 35,000. Maybe it's more mm-hmm. than that now. Maybe it's 40, but you'd never have to get gas. And I haven't ever brought my car in for service. I've had it <laughs> since April of 2018. Um, a couple of times I went in because one of the tires was getting low and uh, also, I lost my serious, you know, satellite connection on my radio. That's a, nothing fundamentally wrong with the car. And if there is, they come out all the way. We live about a half an hour west of downtown Austin where they're based. They'll come out and fix it. I mean, you can't, you can't, you, you almost can't believe it, how easy it is and pleasant, <laughs> not only to drive it, but to maintain it. Um, Veronica? Well, yeah, I'm also coming from a country where we have already more than 80% renewable energy, green energy, and the plan is to be 100% by 2030. I wanna keep telling that story because some people, especially here in North America, are just really surprised. They're like, how is that even possible? So it is possible. And for the next year and the next years, I just wanna keep seeing companies and people in the energy market and the transportation market growing together. You know, these industries were completely separate, but now they kind of grow together. They're tied together by the battery. And so I want to see them collaborating and really understanding because we don't know exactly always what the value of this cooperation is yet because the business models are not formed. I want to, I want to help see them or create this value for for collaborating and then I think we can create the circular economy and especially about electric vehicles and batteries for next year I want to keep seeing companies invest into second life and recycling really to build this this last part of the supply chain also up even though we don't have the second use batteries ready yet but they will be there so I I like seeing seeing this coming and then on a, on a personal note and also what I see lots of people are doing is converting their cars to electric 
electric is also a step that you can take to drive that adoption. You can take your dream car um, that is now having an engine and really also converting that to electric and contribute by that. And, and you then get to reuse all the parts except for the engine, keep using them as opposed to trashing it. <laughs> um, I did see someone use the transmission case as their powder room sink. So there's that option too. <laughs> um, just while we're talking about EVs, we were in the Bahamas in Florida and renting a car and putting the brakes on was a totally weird feeling. Like, oh my gosh, I've got to actually exert energy <laughs> as opposed to it self-braking or just tapping on the brake. So I think everyone here, I know everyone here would agree, but if anyone has any doubts, just go test drive an electric vehicle. It's quiet, it's clean. It's powerful. The braking is like so smart and they don't need much repair at all. That's been my firsthand experience. When I think that the just to, I'm going to circle back a minute, like what Veronica alluded to is in Wisconsin, having a solar panels, it's a illegal situation. I think we're going to see the dealer franchise law come into play quite a bit more this year as well especially like been fast and some of these companies tesla has been at it for a while trying to get exemptions in various states across the country because if you can do a direct sell to a consumer and then have whatever local service provider dealer etc uh you know maintain the service and the customer interaction then it's a win-win because really that dealer franchise law a lot of people a lot of the newer you know market people would say that's an antiquated law we need to get past it and figure out what works for the automotive industry because dealers who stick behind that franchise law they're starting to get a lot of negative press and i can see them really becoming irrelevant in the new market opportunities and it might impact jobs negatively in the beginning but there's so many there's got to be so many jobs in the green evolution um, we have to transform our energy our economy everything so anyone who says that anything that addressing climate change or any of our other environmental crises is a job killer needs to um, uh, take take a little um, lesson watch green tv before we close any last thoughts on you want to like say we're going to go from 2% to 4% electric vehicles in this country or um, nothing that specific, but clearly we're going to see growth. Um, and, 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 or what would you like to see viewers do? I like to end on a, you know, what you can do about it besides test drive. As more. much as I'm not a pickup truck guy, I mm -hmm. think when the F-150 Lightning comes out, I think we're going to see huge movement and not just at the fleet level. I think you're going to have everyone and their brother start clamoring for an electric vehicle. And the, the beauty of that is that people who, you're generalizing here, but I live in Texas now, I see it, who are driving those not electric versions of the F-150 don't seem to be tree hugger types. Just leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> they probably have Trump stickers, you know, during the election and maybe even a gun in the back. But if they get excited about having an electric yeah. version of their truck, hallelujah. <laughs> exactly. And that's the important thing. This, this is exactly what I'm saying. Because it never should have been politicized or stylized or in any way propagandized, but that's yeah. part of the dysfunction in our country in particular right now. For me, I just wish everybody is kind of open, open for a change, open to look into what's possible. Open for better. Richard? Yeah, I think even with the, uh, with the uh, go ongoing supply constraints, we will see as many EVs built, uh, we'll, we will see more EVs built this year and more sales definitely. Uh, people want the cars, and as the price comes down, as infrastructure gets better, it's just it's just a win-win for everyone, and uh, th that will continue in 2022. We'll, we will sell more cars, more EVs. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't know, um, at least I think probably the other um, models too, but Tesla puts their chargers in shopping centers, so you go get something to eat on a road trip or go shopping. It's like, oh no, it's it's done already, really. <laughs> Darn, it wasn't finished. You know, it's just, it's such a user-friendly experience, user-positive experience that I can't think of any drawbacks. And so, you know, it's, it's fun to promote them, isn't it? <laughs> there's, there's not too many things that are that easy to get excited about these days, but hopefully we'll see more on the horizon in terms of green, greener alternatives. Thank you, each of you. Really appreciate it. Want to wish you a clean and green new year, 2022. 
and uh, encourage all of our viewers to go to YouTube, YouTube and uh, sign up, subscribe to Green TV. The more of you that we get as subscribers, the sooner we can expand our programming. And that is the goal to go 24 seven. Why not be a GNN, Green News Network? There's no shortage of things to talk about. Go forth and greenify everybody. You'll feel good. Be part of the solution.